today I have an encouraging message prepared for us. And I think there are many in the room, including myself, that are relieved to hear that it's going to be an encouraging one today. We've just come out of our Judges' Hope for the Horrific series. And Pastor One pointed out for us that as much as things were absolutely horrific some thousands of years ago, they are still quite horrific today. But God. Amen? But God. But God is our hope for the horrific. Jesus Christ is our hope in the horrific. And so my message for us will very much continue in that same vein as we come to God's word today. I'm going to be preaching on a very, very, very well-known text. A text that has often been plastered on coffee mugs and on Christian t-shirts and memorabilia. In fact, my parents ha have this verse, this text, on the front door of my childhood home. Christians love this text, and we love it for a very good reason. Now, I'm sure many of you are thinking it's going to be Philippians 4.13, Jeremiah 29.11, what it is it going to be? All will be revealed so shortly. But we love this text, and we love it for a very good reason, okay? It's an incredibly encouraging text. And it's my prayer that as we come to this text today, that we would mine it for all of its richness, that we would greatly comprehend its context, its meaning, and its implications, and that I would preach it faithfully, and that it would bear fruit in our lives. Amen? Yeah, amen. <sighs> Root of Fellowship family, it's been a tough year. Family, it's been a hard season. And in fact, I have no doubt that there are folks in here this morning who are close to giving up. You're in here today thinking, I'm done. I'm spent. I've run out of hope. I'm all prayed out. I'm poured out, and I'm burnt out. I need, I need God to come through. And if he doesn't, I, 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 don't, I, don't, know, I don't know what's next. I don't know what I'm going to do. Or perhaps you're in here today, and you're not a follower of Jesus, but you've run after the things of the world, and you've realized that nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing can truly, sat truly satisfy you. And so you're in here today feeling empty, and you're wondering, what's the point of all of this? Does my life even matter? If there is a God, does he even see me? I pray that as we come to our text today, that the Holy Spirit would meet each and every single one of us where we are. That he would profoundly meet you and meet me where we are, and that he would see, that we would see that no matter what we are facing, no matter the mountain in front of you, no matter the valley you're stumbling through, friends and family, God is with you. God is with you. He sees you. He is for you. He loves you. And He will sustain you. He will sustain you. And so with all of that in mind, we come to our text for today. You can meet me in your Bible in Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 27 to 31. I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB, and of course it should be up on the screen as well. That's Isaiah 40, verses 27 to 31. Family of God, let's humbly listen to the words of our Father. Isaiah 40, verse 27 says, Jacob, why do you say, and Israel, why do you assert, my way is hidden from the Lord, and claim, and my claim is ignored by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never becomes faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. He gives strength to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Youths may become faint and weary, and young men will stumble and fall. But those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk 
and not faint. Family, this is the word of the Lord, and so thanks be to our good and gracious God. Let's pray. O oh Lord, you spoke, and life came flowing from you, Lord God. You are our good creator. Lord God, you told the seas where to start and where to end. You are everlasting, almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful God. We come before you this morning acknowledging you, adoring you. We come before you this morning bowing before our God, humbly coming before you. You are big, you are glorious, you are infinite, Lord God. You are sovereign. Thank you, Lord God, that in your wisdom you sent Jesus Christ into this world to make a way for us so that we may do what we are doing right now, so that we may know you, so that we may glorify you, so that we may praise you, so that we may love you. Thank you, Lord God, that you made a way. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come right now. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Holy Spirit, come. Lord Jesus, we acknowledge you as the King of kings, and we say, come now, lead us in this time. Call to each one of us by name. Meet one of us, each and every single one of us here, Lord God. Come and speak. Talk to us, Lord God, even as a collective body, as your bride, the church. Come now and have your way in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So, Rooted Fellowship family, this time next week, this time next week, thousands, thousands of men and women will be meeting in the great province of KZN and collectively participating in one of the most important events of the South African calendar. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? I am talking, of course, about the Comrades Marathon. A 90-ish kilometer run from Durban to Peter Maritzburg one year and from Peter Maritzburg to Durban the next year, depending on which year you run. I'm not participating in this race this year. And as I say this, um, my wife would definitely be breathing a sigh of relief to know that I am not lining up this year. But I have run it twice. I've had the privilege of doing it twice. Once in 2017 and once in 2018. I went up in 2017 from Durban to Peter Maritzburg and down from Peter Maritzburg to Durban in 2018. And at this time of the year, as the race preparations start to happen, I often reflect on my very first Comrades Marathon. The run slogan for that year was Zinigele, Zinigele. You'll need to give all of you. The dreaded uprun from Durban to Peter Maritzburg, 87 kilometers of undulating hills. This race requires hours and hours and hours of preparation. You have to respect it, and you have to have a plan for the day. You have to have a race strategy. Zinikele. I had completed over about 1,200 kilometers of training runs. I had even delayed my comrades' run by a few years in order to ensure that I was completely running ready. I was going to be running with my best friend, who already had four comrades medals to his name. I think it was safe to say that we were ready. We were ready. We had a race strategy. We had a goal time. We knew exactly where along the route we'd be meeting up with our family and friends. And as we lined up for the race in Durban CBD that morning, on the 10th of June, 2017, and as we heard the, the, the national anthem get played and then chariots of fire, I confidently thought to myself, we got this. We got this. 15 kilometers went by and we were right on track. We saw the family, we grabbed some food, some energade, and we were on our way again. At around 25 kilometers, we hit one of the big five hills. It's called Fields Hill. Fields Hill, at about 25 kilometers walk. I mean, 25 kilometers in the run. Now, when you do the Comrades Marathon, you don't run the entire way, okay? You don't run the entire way. Not even the pros run the entire way. You need a good run-walk strategy. You have to have a run-walk strategy. 
And so what we would do is we would run for three kilometers, then we'd take a walk. And we'd run three kilometers, we'd take a walk. But as it happened, our three kilometer run happened immediately as we hit Fields Hill. So as we started on the uphill, we hit that, that mark. And being very, very uh, brave, young, bravado men, we decided what we would run the whole way. So we ran all three kilometers, and, we, and it happened to be the length of the hill. We didn't take any walk breaks. I want you to remember that. We didn't take any walk breaks on that hill. No walk breaks. Zinikele. This took it out of us. It was getting hotter and hotter, and we had pushed it a, a bit too much. And by the time that we saw the family again at 45 kilometers, about halfway, my friend, who was also my guide for the day, my friend and I both were struggling. Now, both of us are white guys, and we had covered up and plastered up in plenty of sunscreen. But Kirsty, my wife, will testify that even with all of that, my good friend was still looking very, very pale. I think he must have been see-through. We carried on, though, like the good soldiers we are. We carried on, and slowly but surely, our goal time began slipping away. We had to pull over countless times, and it took us about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes to cover the next five kilometers. Now, comrades runners will tell you that at that pace, you're not gonna make the cutoffs. You're not gonna make the cutoffs. There are certain checkpoints along the route that you need to clear before a certain time, and if you don't, you can't continue with the race. And so slowly but surely, we were in danger of not just missing our goal time, but it got to the stage where we were in danger of not even completing the race. With 50 kilometers down, my friend and I had a conversation, and it seemed as if his race was over. So he hopped onto a rescue bus, we bid each other farewell. I had another 37 kilometers to go. I was without my friend, I no longer had a guide for the day, and I just made it through the next checkpoints in time. I could see the race organizers getting ready to stop people a few minutes behind me. The booms to blockade the route were being prepared to be put in place to stop runners in their tracks. In addition to this, at the next family checkpoint, I was not able to find my wife, and I began to feel very, very weary very disheartened and very much alone. All the years, all the months of training and planning were seeming to amount to nothing. I seemed to be surrounded by runners stumbling and falling, growing weary and faint, and I can still vividly remember one runner crying out on the side of the road as he wrestled with cramp. And speaking blatantly honestly, fam, I know that it was just a running race, but it was a goal or a milestone that had become very important in my life. And honestly speaking, I was starting to break. It felt as if a storm was beginning to rage all around me in the midst of the blistering KZN midday heat. And in that very moment, my heart cried out to God, Lord, do you not see me? Do you not see me? Do you not hear my prayers pleading with you to make a way? And fam, if I'm really honest, these are not just questions that I ask in the midday KZN heat when I run the Comrades Marathon. These are questions that I ask on a daily basis. Do you not see me? Do you not hear my prayers? And I think it would be fair to f say, fam, that as a church, as God's people here at Rooted Fellowship, these are questions that we regularly ask God. We may never speak them or say them out loud, but they are questions that our hearts cry out. Do you not see me, Lord? Do you not hear my prayers? Lord, it wasn't supposed to be like this. Lord, all the preparations, all the planning, all my longings, all my dreams. How long, O oh Lord? This illness, this injury, 
that financial struggle, these family issues, Lord, those unsolved problems, the strife, the loneliness, the pain and the suffering, longing and loss. Do you not see us, O oh God? Do you not hear these prayers? Family, God's people have had these questions for thousands and thousands of years. And in fact, our text today, these questions are questions and feelings that the nation of Israel, God's people, had in Isaiah 40 verse 27. The people of Israel felt hidden from God and they felt as if he was ignoring their prayers. But what was going on around this verse? What caused the Israelites to feel this way? For that, we need to take a closer look at the book of Isaiah. Okay, so this book, as we know, is found in the Old Testament in a time before the nation of Israel is exiled to Babylon. And many, many years before the long-awaited Savior, Jesus, would come into the world to pay the price for our sin. According to the Bible Project, the book of Isaiah was written by, you guessed it, the prophet or messenger, Isaiah. And this book can be split into two sections. Split into two. In chapters 1 to 39, Isaiah pens a message of judgment and hope. Judgment and hope. He prophesies that through firstly Assyria and then Babylon, Israel's kingdom would come crashing down in an act of God's judgment. Now before you ask, mm, isn't this what was happening way back in the book of Judges? We just got into that series, right? That's kind of what we saw there. God's leaders and then his people rebel, which leads to God exerting his judgment on them for their rebellion and for their stubborn and sinful hearts. If you feel this way, or if you feel like you've heard this one before or seen this one, you'd be right. Oh, how forgetful the nation of Israel was. But family, if we're honest, at the same time, how forgetful we are. Isaiah chapter 39 even concludes, concludes with Isaiah's prophecy that Israel's cherished city of Jerusalem would fall into the hands of the Babylonians and that the nation of Israel would be exiled. And all of these prophecies, by the way, did indeed come to pass some 150 years after Isaiah's words. But also, in the first half of the book of Isaiah, the prophet speaks of God's hope. He spoke of hope for a new heavenly Jerusalem where God's kingdom would be restored through the future Messiah, the Savior and King Jesus, and all nations would come together in peace. Which brings us to the second part of the book of Isaiah, from chapter 40 onwards. The second section explores the great hope that God's people have. Chapter 40 opens with an announcement of hope. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. God's people are then told that the exile is now over. Israel's sin has been dealt with and a new era is beginning. And this is exactly historically what happened 150 years after the death of the prophet Isaiah. Chapters 40 to 66 go on to speak about the time some 70 years after the exile to Babylon when the nation of Israel had returned to their homeland and whilst they go on to attempt to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And so Isaiah chapter 40 and onwards are now announcing that a future hope has come. And what a joy it is for us as Christians to know that this future hope has found its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus Christ, our ultimate hope, our future hope has come. And so from Isaiah chapter 40 onwards, these words encourage God's people to respond to God's justice and mercy by becoming God's faithful servants. And they urge them to share with all nations who God truly is. He is a God of mercy and of justice. A God of mercy and of justice. But spoiler alert, that's not what's happening. That's not what the nation of Israel do. Instead, God's people have forgotten all about what God has done in rescuing them from the exile in Babylon. They've forgotten all about that. And instead, they're doing something different. 
they are complaining. Doesn't this sound familiar? Sunday by Sunday, family group by family group, we are blown away by God's holiness and righteousness. We're reminded of his goodness, his mercy, and grace in sending his perfect sinless son, Jesus, as an all-sufficient sacrifice who made a way for us to be reconciled to God and to one another. And we're charged with leaving these spaces to go and tell others about who God is, a God of mercy and of justice, and to tell them about what he's done in sending Jesus. But instead, hardships come along, they knock us down, we quickly forget, and we begin to complain. We move from asking God a question, which, by the way, God can contain. If you don't believe me, go read your Psalms, brothers and sisters. God can contain your questions. Thank you, bro. But that's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about when we move from asking God a question to questioning and challenging God. We move from asking God a question to questioning and challenging God. And that's, that is where we find ourselves today, literally, in the text as we come to verse 27 of Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 27 of Isaiah chapter 40. Jacob, why do you say, and Israel, why do you assert, my way is hidden from the Lord? and my claim is ignored by my God. This is what they're crying out. They're saying, Lord, our way is hidden from you. Our claims are being ignored by you. And so here we have God's people thousands of years ago challenging God. But I believe, family, that's where we find ourselves today. We as, a, we as God's people have forgotten all that God has done for us in Jesus, all that he is doing for us in the power of the Holy Spirit, because family, he does see you and he does hear you no matter what the world, your flesh, or the devil tells you. No matter what your feelings tell, me, tell you, and trust me, as a feeler, as a person who always wants to give voice to how I feel, and as a person who wants to remain in control of everything and make sense of everything that I comprehend, I really need to hear this. God does see you. He does hear you. He knows what he's doing. He's still on his throne. But that's just my word. Don't take my word for it. Let's take God's word for it. Let's see what he says. Verse 28. To the one questioning, God's word responds with some rhetorical questions. Verse 28. Verse 28 says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? Some of you may be film buffs and you might enjoy some good mob movies or mafia movies. And you'll know there's always that part in the movie where somebody messes with the wrong guy. And he says to them, do you not know who I am? Do you not know who I am? Do you not know? Have you not heard? And then Isaiah begins to unpack some of who God is. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never becomes faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. Family, throughout the entire chapter 40, Isaiah seeks to lift God's people's gaze off of themselves, their feelings and their problems and their complaints, and turn their eyes to the everlasting creator God. Now, Isaiah is not saying that our feelings and our circumstances do not matter. On the contrary, we serve a loving and a personal God. Our feelings and our circumstances do matter. But family, Isaiah is telling us that they do not have the last word. Amen? And how does he, how does he do this? He seeks to do this by describing and making much of who God is. He seeks to describe God's power to create. He describes God's provision to sustain, and he details God's presence to help. God creates, God provides, he sustains, and he is an ever-present 
presence in our situation. And then here in this verse, Isaiah reiterates that. He says, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never becomes faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. And in fact, if we go back just one verse, in verse 26, we see that Isaiah says, because of his great power and strength, not one of them is missing. Look up and see the stars. Who created these? He brings out the stars by number. He calls all of them by name. Because of his great power and strength, not one of them is missing. God does something similar. His word does something similar in Job 38, verse 24. Job 38, verse 4. God asks Job, when Job is complaining to him, he says, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions, Job? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy, who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garments and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther. Here is where your proud waves halt. Family of God, God is almighty and all-powerful and even still, he cares for each and every single one of us by name. He knows us deeply and personally. There is no one like our God. There is indeed none like him. He is God. And so our subjective situations do not get the last word on things. Amen? They didn't for Job, and they don't for us. Now, of course, as God's people, we often seek to describe God as best we can with our limited human knowledge and language, and we should seek to do this. We should do this in our prayer time with Him, as we sing songs to Him in praise and worship, and even as we tell others about Him, we must seek to know and describe God. God can be known. He is a God of relationship, but family we must never forget that he is an everlasting God and cannot be fully known or comprehended. We need to be very careful because we limit our understanding of him and his power when we view him in light of what we experience here on earth and when we allow our subjective feelings and our circumstances to dictate what we think to be true about our God. Brothers and sisters, we limit our understanding of him and his power when we view God through the subjective lens of what we're going through. Think about your God. Is he the huge, almighty, all-powerful, ever-present, sovereign, and everlasting God of scriptural revelation? The God as laid out in his word? Or is he the small, limited God of our subjective and personal imagination, the God of our feelings and our circumstances. The Apostle Paul does something similar to Isaiah when he instructs the church in Colossae in chapter three, verse two of Colossians. He instructs them to do something. He says, get above your thoughts and set your minds on things above. Set your mind on things above. Family, I need to hear this this morning you are not your thoughts you are not your circumstances you are not your perception of what is going on and God is not the God of your creation oh how I pray this morning for you and for me that we would know that God is Yahweh the God of scriptural revelation because God the Father when he sees his children and his people going through the most, he does something incredible. He does something incredible. Verse 29, this is what our God does. He gives strength to the faint and strengthens the powerless. He gives strength to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Paul drives home the same point even further when he says in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, he says, the Lord's grace is sufficient for you. For his power is perfected in weakness. 
Therefore, Paul says he will most gladly boast all the more about his weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in him. Sister and brother, are you faint? Are you weary? Are you powerless? And are you weak here this morning? Are you dreading this life? Are you struggling to get over it and continuing to wonder why whatever you are going through is happening to you? Or are you boasting in these weaknesses? When last did we show up to church or family group openly and honestly boasting in our weaknesses? I hurt my back two weeks ago. I feel like I'm getting old. I don't like, say, I don't like talking about it. I'm struggling with back pain. Come, Lord Jesus, come. <laughs> when last do we show up openly and honestly boasting in our weaknesses? It's not very Instagrammable or TikTokable, is that a thing? It's certainly countercultural. It's countercultural today. It was countercultural in Paul's day. And as we're seeing, it was countercultural in post exile Israel's day. It's always been countercultural, as it so often is in the kingdom of God. Friend, when last did you embrace your struggles and boast in your weaknesses, which go on to perfect Christ's power in your life? It's okay not to be okay. It's okay not to have it all figured out. None of us have it all figured out. Netflix, social media have lied to us. We can do nothing on our own, family. We see this. We see this in our text. We see this clearly in verse 30. Verse 30 says this. It says, Youths may become faint and weary, and young men stumble and fall. Youths may become faint and weary, and young men stumble and fall. After reminding God's people of who God is and what he has done for his followers, Isaiah then contrasts this with who we are in our earthly state without the presence of God. He says, youths may become faint and weary, and young men stumble and fall. Family, without God, we will become faint, tired, and weary. We will burn out, we will stumble, we will fall. I know, church, how we need to hear that even these things can be churchy things as well. We can be busy with the things of church. How many church pastors and leaders are burning out as they seek to do things in their own strength? Trying to keep up appearances. Trying to appear as if they are invincible. They have it all figured out out, out there. They're crushing it. And yet they're doing it in their own strength instead of embracing and boasting in their weaknesses. They are performing and pretending as if these weaknesses and struggles do not exist. And don't we do the same? And then what happens? Well, we keep going, we keep going, we keep going, and we go at it successfully for a while, but then over time, we become weary and tired. We look to idols and functional saviors, temporary reliefs, and then we stumble and we fall. And the church is once again rocked by another scandal. Society is rocked. Families are rocked. Brothers and sisters, this should serve as a warning to us all. Lord, have mercy on us all. Amen. Holy Spirit, come now, and may we, your servants, know that we can do nothing, Lord God. We can do nothing that brings you honor and glory in our own strength. Now, as you're sitting here, you may be thinking, Jono, you do not know the depth of what I'm facing. And you're right, I don't. It's not fair what I'm having to put up with. This illness is not fair. The loss of loved ones so dear to me, it's not fair. These financial struggles are not fair. My struggling whilst everyone is out there doing whatever they want to, and it seems as if they're prospering, it's not fair. This loneliness is not fair. This isn't fair. 
and it doesn't feel right. And now you're in here telling us to lift our eyes to the heavens and look to the God who made the heavens and the earth. Okay, okay, I hear you. Then what? Honestly, then what? You wake up tomorrow to everything being perfect. No, that's not what the Lord's word says. Then what? First half of verse 31 tells us. Very first half says, but those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. Let's say that together. But those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. The NRV says those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. The New King James Version says those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. Those who trust, hope, and wait on the Lord will renew their strength. The Hebrew word that Isaiah used for wait was used 49 times in the Old Testament. And this word was kovol, kovol. And it means to expect, to patiently look to, to actively wait upon. Dr. Tony Evans says that this Hebrew word is a picturesque word that also means to bind together. The same Hebrew word found in Deuteronomy, Lamentations, and the Psalms, kovor, was used to describe the plaiting or braiding of hair. Kovor involved binding together multiple strands to make a single stronger strand or rope. And when one did this, you bound things together tightly to make one strong thing. And in fact, family, you bound it together so tightly that it no longer became affected at all by the inconsistent blowing winds. And so family, when Isaiah says, wait on the Lord, he's not talking about passively kneeling down and doing nothing. No, he is saying we need to actively intertwine all the areas of our lives with God. We need to braid our devotional life with our sufferings. We need to plait injustices with our scripture reading. We need to join our illnesses with our praise and worship. We need to bring everything to him and declare and make him Lord over it all. We need to turn away from idols that promise quick fixes. And we need to remain in him so that no matter how hard the winds of this world blow, and many of y'all are facing gale force winds even as we sit here, no matter how hard those winds blow, because of all that waiting and all that braiding and all that plaiting, we'll remain rooted in Christ. Amen? God's people are awaiting people. We see this all throughout Scripture. Noah waited. Abraham and Sarah waited. Joseph waited. Moses waited. Hannah waited. David waited. Israel waited for their promised Messiah. Elizabeth waited. Jesus waited, family. Jesus' disciples and followers waited. And now we're awaiting his return. We wait. We actively wait. And family, when we wait like that, when we actively wait like that on him, well then, the second part of, part of 31 says this. We will renew our strength and soar on wings like eagles. What a beautiful image that is. Soar on wings like eagles. Scholars say that when a mother eagle sees one of its young struggling to fly and plummeting towards doom. It swoops down, grabs hold of its eaglet, and rescues it and soars its wings for the both of them. Family of God, sometimes God swoops down, turns up and completely changes our circumstances. And we pray that he would do that and he does do that. 
Many people in this room could testify to that. And it is my prayer that as you face whatever you're facing today, that God would swoop in, flip the script, and that you would soar with him rejoicing in that miracle. But that's not always what he does. Or it's not what he does immediately. Sometimes, as Isaiah writes, God will equip us to the second part, to run and not get weary. To run and not get weary. You ever come across certain brothers and sisters in the Lord who are going through the most, and yet all that comes out of their mouth is praise and worship. And it's not an inauthentic, God is good all the time, so I'm just fine. No. They're acknowledging their sufferings and their struggles. They even acknowledge that in that moment, God still feels distant. But they don't let these have the final say over their lives. They defy logic and the ways of this world with their ongoing, continued praise of the Lord Jesus, which serves as a megaphone of God's mercy and grace in their lives. And you know what? God uses them to draw people to himself. Those people run and do not grow weary. They run and do not grow weary. And then, then there are those times in a Christian's life where God promises, he promises that there will be those who walk and not faint. There will be those who will walk and not faint. There will be those who just when they think they cannot go on any longer or face another day or take another step, God's grace and his mercy meets them just briefly for a moment and they take another step. And just when they think they cannot go on any longer or face another day or take another step, God's grace and his mercy meets them just briefly in that moment and they take another step. And then they take another step. And just when they cannot go on any longer or face another day or take another step, God's grace and his mercy meets them just briefly in that moment and they take another step. And step by step by step by step, they're walking. And God promises that not only will they not faint, not only will they not faint, but he promises that their present sufferings will not even be worth comparing to the glory of Christ that they will partake in. Romans 8, 18. Their present sufferings will not even be worth comparing to the glory of Christ that we will partake in. Sisters and brothers, regardless of how you're feeling, Jesus is with you in your suffering. He knows suffering. He lived the perfect life. He died an excruciating death and was separated from God the Father so that we may be forgiven for our sins and so that we never have to be separated from our Father, which without Jesus would have been inevitable because of our sinfulness. Jesus then rose again and is coming back to make all things new. Pastor Orne said this last week, he is our one and only true hope in the horrific. Family, we've seen today that through it all, through it all, we are called to wait on the Lord and to know that the creator God who holds the stars in place holds our hearts as well. Nothing in this life is hidden from God. He sees you he understands his Holy Spirit is with you. And so hope expectantly in the Lord, no matter how you feel or what life tells you. And as you do this, he will renew your strength. As you soar on wings like eagles, as you run and to not become weary, as you walk 
and do not faint. There's something powerful in walking in his grace family. One of the things I was told before attempting the Comrades Marathon was to make sure that no matter what, no matter what, whether you're drinking water, whether you're talking to family, whether you're eating, make sure, always at least make sure that you are walking one step at a time in the direction of the finish line. One foot at a time, step by step by step. And so when I hit the 60 kilometer mark back in 2017, I'll never forget the moment. I'll never forget the moment. It felt as if an eagle swooped in and flipped the script. I was running for a club in Joburg East by the name of Edenvale. So that was our club name. And uh, we used to do a lot of training runs with a neighboring club uh, called Bedford View. So we were Edenvale, they were Bedford View. And I'll never forget, I was walking along that road and I was crying out to God. And a Bedford View runner came past me. It struck me as odd. He had an A seating on his, on his shirt. So an A seating means that this person was down to finish within great time. He had an A seating on his, on his number and he had a 10 number color uh, number. So you'd run 10 comrades. We got the talking and it turns out he had a problem with his timing chip. So he had been delayed by an hour and a half at a previous checkpoint. And then we got the talking and I recognized his name. And I said, uh, are you happen to be related to the 2012 comrades winner? And he said, yes, he happens to be my cousin. I know how to run this race. I know how to run this race. And so there I was running my very first comrades with a 10 time veteran cousin to a previous comrades winner. To say this renewed my strength would be an understatement. We began to run and not grow weary, making up more and more and more time. We then came to the final big hill, Polly Shorts. Just as before you get into Peter Maritzburg, we came to that final hill. And my new running partner said something strange to me. He said we were gonna do something that many of the pros and winners did in order to ensure that they finished the race strong. It was something that I would never have thought of and I believe that God used it to change the outcome that day. He said to me, he said, if we wanna make sure beyond any shadow of a doubt that we will complete this race, his 11th and my first, if we're gonna complete this race before the 12 hour cutoff, he said, we're gonna have to do something strange and counterintuitive. He said, we're gonna walk. We're gonna walk this last big hill. Step by step by step. We walked up that hill into the town of Peter Maritzburg. We did not grow faint. In fact, once again, our strength was renewed. As we saw the crowds gathering on the pavements and cheering, cheering runners home before the cutoff, we walked step by step. We began to run. And I'll never forget that feeling of coming around the first corner into the stadium and seeing my beautiful bride, Kirsty, on the other side of the fence shouting, go, go, go. We finished that race with only a few minutes to spare. Ben can come up as I begin to close this out. Family, I'm convinced that I would never have finished it if God had not intervened in a powerful way. No matter how I felt, he saw me, he heard me, he was not too far. In fact, he was right on time. Sisters and brothers, he sees you. He hears your prayers. He is not too far off, and he won't be late. He will renew your strength as you soar on wings like eagles, as you run and do not become weary, as you walk and do not faint. As I pray, I'm gonna begin by praying the words of a song called Stars by a band that I, that I love very much. And these songs have reminded me of the great and everlasting God we serve, who holds every minute of our lives in his hands. And so I'm gonna invite you to stand as I pray for us, and then we will respond in song. Everlasting God, almighty God, all-powerful God, you spoke a word and life began. We come before you today 
as your people, acknowledging you as the God who told oceans where to start and where to end. Oh, glorious God, you set time and space in motion. And yet, Lord, you came to earth and died for us. And you know each and every single one of us by name. We pray, oh, Father, that we would know that, God, if you can hold the stars in place, you certainly can hold our hearts. Remind us of that, O oh Lord. Send others around us to remind us of that. May we be reminded of this as we read your word. We pray that, Lord, that we would do this so that in those dark, deep times that come our way, we would know that nothing, absolutely nothing can separate us from your sight. That we would know that if you can calm the harshest storm, you can calm the storms in all of us, Lord God. I pray that we would know that you are the, you are the God who is never too late, the God who is never too far away, and that ultimately, Lord, we have nothing to fear. And so come, Holy Spirit, as we wait on you. Come, Holy Spirit. Will you renew our strength as we soar on wings like eagles, as we run and do not become weary, as we walk and do not faint, in the power of your Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. We're waiting on you. We're waiting on you, Lord.